On this page, we're going to look at the mechanism of action for a number of antithyroid drugs. We have two ways on this page for you to do that. The first way is to look at this table, which describes the steps in thyroid hormone synthesis and where various drugs can interfere. The figure does the same thing. So you can use this table, but I'm going to spend our time going over the figure on the next slide. This figure looks at thyroid hormone synthesis. We'll follow the steps in the process and also look at where our drugs are going to interfere. You start with the uptake of iodide. Once inside the thyroid gland, iodide is converted into iodine by thyroid peroxidase. You then undergo the organification step to form MIT and DIT and the coupling of T3 and T4 to thyroglobulin. We'll start with the first process here, which is the uptake of iodide. This is the basis for the use of I-131, radioactive iodine, is selectively taken up into the thyroid gland. The beta radiation associated with this drug causes localized destruction of the thyroid. And most often, this is considered the drug of choice for patients with hyperthyroidism. Of course, there are populations where I-131 would not be the preferred drug. In young kids or in pregnancy, you want to stay away from the radiation. We have a group of drugs called thioamides. The most common one that we remember is propylthiouracil, but we'll have another one we'll discuss called methemazole. These drugs block multiple steps in thyroid hormone synthesis, including blocking the enzyme thyroid peroxidase. Once we release thyroid hormones into the blood, we release T3 and T4, but we convert T4 to its active form T3 by the enzyme 5 prime diiodinase and that enzyme is blocked by propranolol, the beta blocker, and propylthiouracil. On this slide, we discuss the properties of the thioamides, propylthiouracil and methimazole. They can be used as alternatives to iodine-131 in uncomplicated hyperthyroid. Propylthiouracil is different from methimazole in that it's the one of the two that can inhibit 5' diiodinase because both drugs affect earlier steps in thyroid hormone synthesis. You have to watch out for agranulocytosis as a side effect for both of these drugs. And this side effect certainly is a popular test question. But given a choice between these two drugs, today we're more likely to go with methemazole, and that's because of my clinical vignette at the bottom. We have seen severe liver failure with PTU, which has relegated this drug to being a backup to methimazole. Well, we do consider using PTU in the first trimester of pregnancy, and that's because PTU is more highly protein bound, and that means it's a little bit safer, especially in that first trimester. If you think about other drugs we've covered that have thyroid effects, you have to think about amiodarone the drug that contains iodine. Do you remember? Is it hypo, hyper, or both with this drug? It's both, because amiodarone can replace thyroid hormone or it can inhibit thyroid hormone. So hyper or hypothyroidism are a possibility. With lithium, another drug that has hypothyroid effects because of affecting thyroid hormone release. So remember those two drugs in addition to the other standard antithyroid agents. Occasionally, you can use iodide in the form of potassium iodide plus iodine. We call that Lugol's solution, and this is sometimes used in thyrotoxicosis. The problem with Lugol's solution is that the thyroid gland does not respond to this drug after about 10 days, so it's only used short term. I'll also use this slide to remind you that one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in the U.S. is levothyroxine, which is T4, commonly used for replacement therapy. That could be a patient with hypothyroidism, or it could be a patient who had hyperthyroidism, was treated with iodine-131, and now needs replacement therapy with levothyroxine.